welcome back. Today we have an awesome ornamental edible gardening expert with us. Her name is Nikki Jabour. She has a radio station uh, that hosts a radio show herself, and she's written some rather beautiful books. I love her books. Hey, Shauna. Hey, Rich. How are you guys doing today? We're doing well. Thanks for coming on the show. Fantastic. So happy to have you. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. (laughs) Tell us a little bit about, you've had some exciting things happen this year, and I know that you have one book that just came out. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, um, that is a book that you contributed to. Thank you so much, Shauna. It's called Groundbreaking Food Gardens, and essentially it came about because of my curiosity as a gardener. I'm always wondering what other gardeners, specifically food gardeners, how they do things, what they like to grow, how do they stake their tomatoes. I mean, there's so many questions for food gardeners, so I kind of stopped um, about 72 of my favorite food gardeners from across North America and the UK, including you, and um, made you, you know, <laughs> contribute to the book, answer my many questions and emails and all the ways that I annoyed people for about a year and a half. Um, <laughs> and this book is the end result, so basically it's taking a look at all these incredible food gardeners and how they do what they do. And, you know, they shared a lot of great information with me. So that's what this book is about. That cracks me up. So you were stalking Shauna. How, <laughs> how, did, you, how did you and Shauna meet? And how did you know about her and her amazing edible uh, garden? Well, I mean, I've been a fan of Shauna for a long time. Uh, I follow her on Facebook. And, I mean, the things you do with your front yard garden, you know, in your community and all the food you donate. I mean, and of course, you know, you've got books out. Um, of course, and, but uh, this is a mutual love fest because I, I <laughs> think Nikki is way. awesome. It is, though, because, you know, um, trying to connect community mm-hmm. with food, that whole organic connection is a challenge. And Nikki and I are living that. We really want to make a difference in our communities, and she's certainly doing it. And I think we live in similar zones. I mean, I know we're not in similar geographical areas, but, you know, I'm on the east coast of Canada, right by the ocean, and, you know, you're you're a Chicago area, and, you know, but still, we're both zone 5, five Mm 5B-ish, I believe, and uh, so we tackle similar, you know, challenges in the garden. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I was going to ask, because I'm totally... Uh, ignorant to where you were, so and now now I know because I was going to ask where are you and you're, so you're Canadian. You're from Canada. Hey, yeah. Hey, uh, you guys Canada have a great drove, reputation. I moved to New York City in about ten or eleven hours. Okay. Yeah. So head head right down. So. Well, you have a reputation of being extraordinarily nice people. Oh. Ca- yeah, Canadians but, are. Nikki nice is though. She is. If you That's talk a great story. I will probably apologize. <laughs> That, Canada, so you know you gotta go with it. That would make my day. I just you know, <laughs> so 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 Nikki, you know we're gonna we're gonna get into into talking about some of the tips and techniques, and we're talking about ornamental edible gardens and starting them early, especially someone like yourself that's up in Canada, and obviously we're in the Chicagoland area, in the Midwest, but this is a national show, and we're trying to give tips for everybody. But you now basically, yeah. it's gonna start a, bit, a little bit later for people um, up north, but. Cold frames. You guys talk about that a little bit in, in uh, I know, in Shauna's book, and we talk a little bit, of, I'm assuming, in your book. What is a cold frame? How can somebody, how can an average consumer make one out of, you know, on a small budget, and what's the purpose for it? Well, I think a lot of gardeners think of cold frames as a magic box um, because, you know, it's essentially just a bottomless box. Usually it's made out of wood, uh, but they can be made out of plastics or concrete blocks or bricks or lots of things. Um, but essentially, it just creates a microclimate around your plants, you know, and you can seed vegetables or even start seedlings for your flower gardens and things like that in there so much earlier. Like, for example, there's never a day in my garden, and it's about 2,000 square feet, my food garden. Wow. Um, there's never a day I don't have at least 30 different types of vegetables to harvest, even, you know, in January, February, March, April. There's still a lot of food up there, and it's because I use devices like cold frames, uh, and they shelter salad greens and root crops and and like leafy greens like kale and lettuce and spinach and all those great things. Um, so a cold frame is just a great, easy, inexpensive way to extend your garden and extend the harvest. And, uh, you know, you can even make them out of straw bales. Surround a garden bed mm-hmm. with straw bales, top it with, a, you know, a piece of hard plastic or an old shower or an old door, um, you know, and boom, you've got a cold frame. So you're, you're harvesting edibles in outdoors in January, February? Yeah, and again, I live in Canada. And you live in Canada? <laughs> 
<laughs> we get a lot of snow. Yeah, I have she rocks. my cold frames in midwinter when you lift off the wow. cover and it's like two feet of snow around the top of the cold frame. Uh -huh. And all you look down into the snow pile and see, you know, all the carrots in the cold frame. That's uh, got to yeah, freak people I mean, out when you show them pictures of that or show them that in person. Because, you know, I think the average person would think, no way there's plants growing, especially something that's ready to harvest right now. It doesn't freak them out. It gets them excited about gardening. I, which think, is I it. think they question it first. Like, you know, my first book, The Year on Vegetable Gardener, people see the cover, which is me in January at my cold frames. And when we did the cover shoot for that, I said, listen, you can, you know, photo edit my hair, but do not touch the way the vegetables look. You have to realize <laughs> this is exactly how they look. When you lift up those covers in January, February, you know, March, it is green in those cold frames and it smells like spring. And uh, it's just incredible. It's, it's, and the winter garden is so, I mean, it's ridiculously, you know, no work whatsoever. So I think people are really coming around to stretching the seasons. Do you have a favorite cold frame vegetable to grow? Like what is it, you know, from seed that you would start to grow and really experience? <laughs> you know, I, I mean, we have a whole cold frame just of carrots because they taste so, I mean, you know how great they taste in the wintertime when all those starches turn to sugars and they're so sweet. Um, but I, I love mosh as well, which is a lovely mm. um, kind of succulent green. It grows so well in these tiny little rosettes. And you just harvest the rosettes whole at the ground level and a um, little bit of lemon juice, a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of salt, and you've got a gourmet salad that is just so good. And it doesn't matter how cold it gets. I have never had a winter yet where my mosh did not thrive. So I just love that salad green. Wow. So that, that's a really good, uh, good suggestion. Cause I, I never even thought to plant that. And, and especially in the Midwest, I think that people are learning more about different types of leafy greens that they weren't accustomed to growing and, or using in, in their just everyday meals and cooking. And, you know, kale obviously has become uh, pretty well known as a superfood. but let me ask you this, Nikki, starting seeds, do you start the seeds outside in the cold frames or do you start them indoors in the winter time and then move them out? Uh, I, I mainly start my seeds, they're direct seeded in the cold frame. And usually for late fall, winter, early spring crops, things are actually seeded, um, you know, in like September, depending yep. on the crop. Uh, carrots are seeded in early August, but most things are seeded like salad greens, mosh, and kales are seeded in September in the cold frames directly. And then as, you know, the space empties out come February and March when we have more day length as well, more sunlight, uh, any empty areas get reseeded. You know, again, it might be really cold outside. And there might be snow. Mm -hmm. But I'm not trying to grow tomatoes or zucchini. I'm growing the cold tolerant vegetables. So I can start seeding lettuce and spinach and arugula and kale and things like that mm -hmm. in the empty areas of the cold frames in February and March. And they're just going to they're going to grow. They grow. It takes a little bit longer to germinate. You I was going to say the soil temperature has got to be a lot colder. Yeah, exactly. So it's a little slower to start. But as long as they have that sunlight and the cold frame creates that microclimate and captures the solar energy, they will grow rather quickly. I'm still harvesting long before my neighbors are doing their spring planting. Oh, that's amazing. I want to know some simple tips to boost that yield, you know, of, uh, of any time of year, really. I mean, in cold frame season, of course, but uh, early spring especially. How can we get more volume, more plants? How does it work? Oh uh, my gosh, there's so many ways to take your vegetable garden and make it a super productive vegetable garden. Um, you know, generally I do a lot of things like interplanting where I plant more than one type of crop in the same bed. Uh, usually I do it because, um, you know, the, the plants will grow well to together. But say I plant kale seedlings, you know, in my early, early spring or late winter vegetable garden. You know, it takes a long time for those seedlings to really fill in. So for the month or so in between when they're really growing actively, uh, I'll plant some lettuce seed or arugula seed or something that grows quickly, you know, on the ground. So therefore, it will help trap water, prevent, mm -hmm. you know, the, the soil from drying out. Um, it will also prevent weeds from growing, which is always a nice thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'm also getting a second harvest out of that space before the kale would need it. So uh, you can interplant, you can succession plant. I think any vegetable gardener needs to know how to succession plant, which is basically following one crop with another. So say when your early spring peas come out, you know, put some bush beans in. Mm -hmm. Put some, you know, something else in that space, maybe some zucchini. Wow, that's excellent Something advice. that will just keep that garden bed constantly going. And of course, in between crops, you want to add a little bit more compost, a little bit more aged manure, just to keep your soil health high. But, you know, you can get a lot of, you know, food out of one single garden bed by succession planting. So now you're giving a lot of great tips and, and giving a lot of varieties out. And we're talking about uh, more on the edible <laughs> side of things. But, you know, in your new book... You're talking about ornamental edible gardens. Well, really all vegetable gardens, but there's a lot of ornamental design in this mm. book. It's kind of amazing, um, the creativity that she's expressed and that the people that have worked with her have done. 
So, well, and that's your that's your vegetable garden, Sean. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's in the front yard, and if people walk by it, they're not going to think, "Oh, a vegetable garden." You know how unattractive. It's not a utilitarian space. Right. It's incredible and colorful, and you're picking varieties that are more colorful and. You know, so you're inspiring people to realize that vegetable gardens are not dull and boring and don't have to be hidden in the backyard. If your only sunny space is the front yard, you know, you go for it. Have fun, grow food, and maybe you'll, you know, encourage other people to grow food as well. Yeah. See, Rich, you need to live large. I, I think, <laughs> I, I know I'm inspired by, by Shauna in, in her yard, but I tell you what, Nikki, I, I wish you had a little bit more energy about the subject. <laughs> My I, goodness. I have a lot of cups of tea. Yeah. <laughs> Say. Is that a Canadian thing too? Tea? Oh yes, yes. And let, I, I'm sorry. When I come to the U.S., which I do probably five or six times a year, I bring my own tea bags. <laughs> of course, that's the only way to go. <laughs> oh, so funny. I yeah. like a nice strong cup of black tea. Now, do you also making you know, that like a lot of people grow in their uh, vegetable gardens and herb gardens their own tea? Do you grow tea or grow tea accessories? You know, like uh, rose hips and that I sort like of that. thing. Yes. I I do grow a lot of my own tea. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. I grow chamomile tea. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I grow chamomile not just for the tea, which, you know, but the tiny little flowers, they smell like green apples. Mm -hmm. um, they attract a lot of really good uh, bugs to the garden, like hoverflies. And, you know, so they actually make my vegetable garden healthier by planting some of these plants in it. Um, but yes, I have lots of mints um, in pots to the side of the garden so they don't take over the world, uh, as well as things like chamomile and strawberry leaves and uh, raspberry leaves and things like this. Sounds wonderful. I love mints, but I've noticed that some are fantastic in cooking and others aren't. Like chocolate mint smells really good. It does smell chocolatey, but if you put it in a cocktail, it tastes horrible. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I don't understand the connection there, but uh, so having a variety of mints is a really good idea and the, the bees go crazy for it. Oh, they totally do. And I have a mint patch in the shade and it's become my ladybug um, incubation little area yeah. where for some reason every year ladybugs emerge there and they lay their eggs. And you know what those beautiful little funny looking uh, larvae form of the ladybug looks like. Mm -hmm. And they're so great. So they eat so many aphids in the garden. So I'll go and take the little uh, baby uh, ladybugs and put them up where I need them in the vegetable garden, uh, you know, so then they can eat the bad guys in the vegetable garden. So mint is just an incredible plant for, for gardens. But again, it tends to be invasive. So make sure you put it in a pot or it somewhere where invasive. it can run. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Nikki, you know, you're, you're starting to, you mentioned a couple of different things you're on, now on the kind of entomology or insect side of things. You mentioned a couple of different pollinators and are you planting specific plants for the purpose of getting more production by attracting different pollinators into your garden? You know, I think it's the biggest garden trend for 2015. Um, basically planting, whether you're a vegetable gardener or a flower gardener, planting for the pollinators and the beneficial insects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like Shauna, most gardeners know nowadays that most of the bugs in your garden are not the bad guys. Mm -hmm. uh, a good portion of them are very important uh, to the, you know, the whole ecosystem of the garden. It's, and I mean, diversity in the garden is going to bring in a lot of good guys. So I plant a lot of things um, like sweet alyssums, a lot of uh, sunflowers, um, zinnias, nasturtiums, so many different types of flowers and herbs like dill and parsley that will bring in the good guys as well and just it makes my, my garden healthier. And the more pollinators you get in, it means the more food your garden's going to produce without doing any extra work. Because more pollinators means more of the flowers on, say, your zucchini vines get pollinated, which means more zucchini, even though you haven't increased your plant volume. So, I mean, there's so many reasons to, um, to bring in more pollinators. And there's a great book that came out last year, uh, Attracting Beneficial inse Insects mm -hmm. to Your Garden. Mm -hmm. And it's a Bible right now for learning, you know, what plants are the best ones for bringing in the good guys. I had a grower once tell me that if it wasn't for ladybugs, the earth would be covered about two feet deep in aphids. Wow, 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 wow. I think that might be an yeah, exaggeration, be but, but you, you know, know what? You we, get the point. We do at my house, I have a secret. I have a 14-year-old at home, and I pay her three cents a Japanese beetle. <laughs> okay, so she goes out with her little gloves on, and she kidnaps Japanese beetles off of the plants that they're eating. They're not beneficial, obviously. Uh, they ca can cause devastation. Mm -hmm. Well, instead of using a chemical, I use my kid. And she then throws these Japanese beetles into a bucket of soapy water. And then, of course, we count them at when she's done. And some days there's three, and some days there's 150. So she could make a lot of money this way. <laughs> I do the same thing with my 13-year-old son, actually, except I pay him for slugs. Uh, uh, slugs awesome so I'm him a nickel a slug so i'm thinking maybe i should cut that nickel back to three cents now. hey the canadian exchange rate though <laughs> yeah I don't it's know. a little yeah. higher yeah. exactly but here in nova scotia we're organic so you know even if i have a, a big pest problem i can't go and spray chemicals 
I have to figure a way to, you know, to, to get around it using organic substitutes and things like that. Do you guys um, have a so phosphorus ban there? Yeah, yeah, we have pesticide bans. Mm -hmm. um, so, you this know, makes so me happy. Use, to be it makes me happy. Yeah, well, I mean, it's been since 1999, so it's nothing new. We can't even use weed and feed on our lawns. So you guys were organic before it was cool. <laughs> but it's a good thing we need more of that and we certainly mm -hmm. want it and we're all crying for it in the united states and uh it's not happening so not happening quick enough anyway uh so you have got the right attitude and uh having a 13 and a 14 year old of course helps yeah yeah it yeah. certainly does <laughs> although i find the older they get the less willing they are to help in the garden they just want to eat but not <laughs> exactly. I mean, you're teaching them a great skill as well and you know you're giving them some life lessons for later on you know that hard work pays off and and you know you know kids need to learn about working in the garden at while they're kids because that's going to only help them later on so they can kind of appreciate it they shouldn't be sitting inside playing video games all day although i know my kids do at times but it's balance you got to get them out there working in the yard and get used to that outdoors and that's I, I'm glad to hear that you you're doing that. Oh, totally. Nikki, do you I, like when I was a kid, I want to know if you remember this, too. You know, like my grandparents had these fabulous gardens mm -hmm. and I loved going out and helping them. However, when it came to weeding, like I hated weeding, it was this horrible thing. And now as an adult, uh, it kind of brings me a little bit of therapy. Mm -hmm. I really love it. What about you, Nikki? Jana, yes, <laughs> it's yeah. true. But do you I remember kidding, being yeah. I was the family vegetable garden weeder. <laughs> um, and I think my mother's not watching, but our, our vegetable garden was rather weedy, and um, it's a miracle I still want to grow food. But uh, and I, I was a fussy eater, so I think the vegetable garden as a kid really helped me to eat better food and eat more food because it encouraged me. Once you grow something, you want to eat it, and so it kind of opened my world up, which is one of the reasons I'm always trying to grow lots of new crazy vegetables now too. Um, but weeding is therapeutic, and you know I actually like thinning carrots now. Which is strange too. <laughs> there you go. I might uh, be the only one. I want to know, uh, since we're really, to jump back to the original topic, uh, what is your list of like your favorite early spring vegetables that you might recommend? Um, you know, I'm in love with um, peppermint stick Swiss chard right now. Oh. I mean, I, I grew it last, this last mm -hmm. year and I mean, it's electric hot pink and white stem. Huge, huge. It's beautiful. Dark green leaves. Mm -hmm. It thrives in cool and cold temperatures. Oh, it's great. It's great for container gardens. It's great for vegetable gardens. I planted borders of it everywhere because I could not get enough of the stems. In fact, I almost didn't want to eat it because it was just too pretty. Um, but, you know, I love the Swiss chard. Uh, arugula is my favorite salad green, I think. So I grow lots of arugula, probably around 20 types of lettuce. You know, we're planting early, early spring radishes and um, baby beets and, uh, you know, lots of peas, of course, kales. Uh, I love a lot of the Asian greens as well, the, the mustards and mizunas. Bok choy. Bok choy. Uh, you know, the the, uh, the Chinese cabbages, too. So many great vegetables. And, I mean, you know, you might think vegetable garden, you've got potatoes, carrots, tomatoes. But there is such diversity out there for every type of food you might want, ever want to eat. So I really encourage people to try different things and uh, and not be afraid to experiment in their vegetable gardens. I've never heard of that peppermint stick Swiss chard. And I, it sounds like something I'd like to try this year. It's beautiful. Oh. You convinced me because I've been doing bright lights for years. Mm -hmm. And I have these Very fabulous photos of mm -hmm. bright lights, right? Uh, yeah. But peppermint stick is indeed gorgeous. Gorgeous. It's like it's almost looks like it has stripes on it. It's really? amazing. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna have to check it that really out. Does have stripes on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and oh, and did you grow the uh, cucumelons last year, Shauna? I didn't, like but I heard about them. Everyone was talking about cucumelons. Yeah. Cucumelons. Yeah, that, that was probably the most popular vegetable in our garden last year. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, my gosh, so amazing! I probably picked around five or six hundred of these tiny little watermelon uh, looking little teeny mini me little melons cucumbers and they were fabulous huh. and they're great in cocktails i mean because they're miniature so they're like this great little appetizer cocktail sort of thing yeah. and uh, i say we bring our cocktails to the garden what about you nikki <laughs> <laughs> I have about 14 mugs of tea up there somewhere. Um, <laughs> I have to start looking because my mug cupboard is getting pretty empty. So, yeah. Well, I tend to garden, uh, you know, in the evening. I can see bringing a glass of wine up there. But uh, generally, I've got a mug of tea with probably at least a scoop of dirt in it somewhere. <laughs> wow. There you have it. Hey, yeah. we are at the end of our show time. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, what is the next step, next adventure for Nikki? What are you doing this year? Well, I, I, I co-own a website called Savvy Gardening with a great bunch of garden writers, so we're really growing that. Uh, I'm working on a next book I really should be doing right this very second. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm still writing for magazines like Fine Gardening and Birds and Blooms and Horticulture Magazine. As if you, in your spare time. 
Yeah. Right. Spare, <laughs> what a spare time. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for being on our show. I hope you'll come yes. back sometime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Sean. I really appreciate thanks, it. And I would love to come back. I learned a lot. As usual, when we have these guests, I always learn something new. I'm, I'm an accredited horticulturist, been in the garden center industry for 15 years, and I'm still learning new things every time we bring on one of these experts. So, exactly. And Nikki was no it's exception. It's gardening, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks again, Nikki. We'll talk thanks, to you soon. Sir. Bye-bye. Feeding your lawn every year and still not satisfied? That's because you're doing half the job. You must feed your soil, too, with Jonathan Green's new American Lawn Plan. Your soil is filled with nutrients, but many never reach the grass because your soil biology hasn't been activated. This includes nutrients from your lawn fertilizer, too. Jonathan Green's new American Lawn Plan corrects the problem with two soil-reviving fertilizers. Love your lawn, love your soil, and Magic Cow. Love Your Lawn, Love Your Soil has a special organic formula that activates soil biology, releasing trap nutrients while loosening up soil for deeper root growth. MagiCal balances soil pH, so nutrients from lawn fertilizers don't go to waste and weeds don't become a problem. Do the whole job. Feed your lawn and your soil with Jonathan Green's New American Lawn and get the great lawn you've always wanted. Pick up the new American Lawn at Alsip's Nursery and other fine independent retailers.